Well, good morning, everyone. How are you today? Great to see you on a Saturday morning. My name is Christine Alessandro. I'm the Executive Director of Bay Path Elder Services, which is the Aging Services Access Point and Area Agency on Aging for Metro West. Many of you may know us through our home care program, through our caregiver program, money management program, Meals on Wheels. Those are some of the few programs that we provide. Our new initiative is called Come to Be Dementia Friendly, and we started this about a year ago. And the purpose is to create dementia-friendly communities. We know that dementia, the number of folks with dementia, will triple by 2050. One in nine individuals over 65 has Alzheimer's, and one in three over 85 has Alzheimer's. So this really is a public health issue that we need to start addressing now. And we want to make sure that people have the ability to stay in their community, to remain engaged in their community, and be able to live in the setting of their choice. But before we get going, I'd like to invite up Janice Long, who's going to tell you a story. Janice? Thank you, Christine. Um, I'm the Hudson Senior Center Director, and so um, as a director for 10 years, I can see the need for dementia-friendly communities. But this actually hit me on a personal level, and this is the story that I want to share with you. My mother, who was diagnosed with um, dementia several years ago, and in the beginning, it was just you know some short-term memory loss, and things were still okay. People would come to visit her. Things were fairly normal. But as the disease progressed, and she was experiencing behavioral issues, such as some paranoia, some suspicion, people just weren't coming around as much anymore to visit her. And that was not good for her. She really needed the socialization. This um, one, one evening, I took my mother out to dinner with my daughter. And we went to um, Cracker Barrel, thank you, the Cracker Barrel restaurant. And it was kind of an impromptu thing to do, so she didn't have her walker. I just took her and I said, oh, well, you can hold on to my arm and we'll just walk in. So we went into the restaurant. You could tell she was having some difficulty, but we sat down. We were given the menus. And shortly after, the waitress came up and she just bypassed my mother and looked at me and said, what would she like? And I was mortified, but even more so my mother was. And I said, you know what, why don't you just give us a few more minutes and we'll find out what she wants. And so that was just enough. I, the ter term I use is to shut her down. She just kind of got very quiet. She withdrew. And um, I helped her with the menu. And then they came back and I ordered the, the meal for my mom. Um, at the end of the meal, and my mother was very quiet during the, the meal, um, at the end of the meal, the waitress came back and said to me, didn't she do a great job? I was mortified, just mortified. So that was not a great experience for my mom, and it wasn't a great experience for me and my daughter. And as Christine said, you know, more and more people are being diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And she gave the number one in nine people will be diagnosed with Alzheimer's. I want to say it a different way. One in nine families are going to have to deal with this disease. And it isn't easy. It's a very difficult disease to, to deal with. Um, as with my mother, you have the short-term memory loss, you have the behavioral changes, and you also have physical changes. You know, the mobility is affected at some point. So it's a very challenging disease, and people need to, to have some socialization, and that's the parts that, that's missing as the, as the disease progresses. Um, the, um, the initiative for the Dementia Friendly Community is a great initiative. I'm so glad Christine invited the Hudson community to participate in it. And the goal is that volunteers from the different sectors in our community will get together and, and, and change the attitudes towards um, Alzheimer's and try to create a community that's maybe a little more informed but a lot more respectful towards people with um, dementia and Alzheimer's. Thank you. Thanks, Janice. And when Janice told me that story, I was very, very shocked because that's not the experience that we want folks to have in the community. 
We want folks to have opportunities for engagement. If you go into a restaurant that you're treated with dignity and respect, or if you go to the bank that perhaps they know that you have a little bit of memory loss, but you want folks to stay engaged in the social fabric of the community. Another story I can tell you did not happen in this community, and it's a true story. A gentleman and his wife went to church one Sunday and the wife had Alzheimer's disease. In the middle of the homily, the wife stood up and yelled, Hitler. At the end of the service, when the gentleman and his wife were leaving the church, the pastor pulled him aside and asked them not to come back because of his wife's behavior. And we don't want that to happen. You still need those social engagement opportunities. So if you can't sit through an hour service, can we have a small church group where we can all say the prayers that we knew from our childhood? No matter what the faith, we all know those prayers from our childhood. This program is also going to sustain caregivers. Caregiving is one of the highest unpaid jobs in the nation worth billions of dollars every year. It's going to equip communities to be dementia friendly. What about those first responders? What about the police who may not know someone has some memory loss? And if you do something wrong, they come over and put you in handcuffs? Not a good idea. And lastly, we want to raise awareness and reduce stigma by engaging the communities. With the opioid crisis, the hashtag for Twitter is state without stigma. And I fully believe that dementia needs to be under that umbrella. There should not be a stigma associated with dementia. So this is an illustration of what a dementia-friendly community looks like on the broad level. So you want dementia-friendly businesses, accessible user-friendly transportation, especially when you can't drive anymore. You want to make sure there's dementia aware and responsive client services and that there are continuing opportunities for those engagement. Early diagnosis and quality care. Less than one third of patients who are diagnosed with dementia are given that diagnosis by their doctor. Leaving the person to wonder, what is wrong with me? Finally, we want independent living and meaningful engagement. We want folks to stay in the setting of their choice. I've never heard anyone say, I want to go to a nursing home. That just doesn't happen. But if you can stay at home with a caregiver, and you can go out with a caregiver, maybe have a lunch or a dinner where people are trained and can recognize that you're having some difficulty, what a great experience that would be. So now I'm going to talk about the process that we're using for a dementia-friendly community. And I'm going to ask Janice to join me, because Janice's community of Hudson is very actively involved in this, and I'm going to ask her some questions, and she's going to tell you what they've done. So the first step in developing a dementia-friendly community under our project, and this is only one project of several in the state, the first thing to do is to convene an action team. So Janice, can you tell me how you convened that action team? Yes, what we did in Hudson was we had a huge community meeting, and um, we had about 30, 40 people attend. Like 80. Oh, it was, it was more than that then. <laughs> so we had a lot of people come to the meeting, and Christine was there, and we talked about the need for dementia-friendly community. And we told people that if you wanted to volunteer at that level at the action team to let us know, and actually we had a lot of people sign up a sheet and say that, yes, they were very interested in getting involved at the action team level and survey level. Right. And I think you have about 20 folks on your action team, actually. You have a pretty big one. So your action team met for a couple of months, and then they entered the second phase of this entire process, which is doing a survey in the community. Because our project is grant funded, it was really important that we had data that we could show. And the survey was already developed for us. And I also feel data is important because I don't want to go into a community and say, this is what you need if I'm not living there. The community knows their gaps. The community knows what they need. So Janice, tell us about that assessment phase and the surveys. That was actually kind of fun. We had another meeting. <laughs> and we always had food at our meetings, so that was great and, and lots of fun. But anyway, we ended up with over 20 people who wanted to do the surveys. And they were sector-specific surveys. So there was um, a certain survey for the business community, for the local government, for your faith community. 
and people would just sign up and I said if you do one or two that's all we need just one or two and that would be great because sometimes when pe we, you ask people to do surveys I think oh I don't want to do that but if you just say like a small amount well they did over a hundred 104 something like that and so it was great it was a lot of fun and it got the community talking and that was a great part of the survey yeah. experience and that was really an engagement and really started to get the word out. And what the survey does, it identifies where the gaps are in the community and asks folks what do they think is the priority for the need. So example, we have the community, uh, one survey question has to do with um, resources for the community, especially for underserved and bilingual populations. So if you think your community doesn't have that and you think it's a high priority need, that's how we mark it on the survey and that's how we develop what your priorities are going to be. So the third phase is analyze the findings and I just actually spent a month doing the analysis for three communities. This, the communities are Hudson, Northboro, and Marlboro. We're starting out there. And I did tally 300 plus surveys. And this week I had the directors together along with our leadership team to present the results of the surveys to tell people what their identified priorities are. What's high on the list and what should the community work on? And Janice, tell us about that and were there any surprises in the analysis? Actually, we all thought the three directors, the three different communities, we all thought that um, the results were going to be different in each community. And we were surprised to find out that it was very much the same. Um, one area was training, that the community thought that we needed more training um, in the area of awareness. And um, another area was what you talked about. In, uh, in Hudson, we have a large Portuguese population and that we, maybe we need more materials and resources in Portuguese. And you had, in all three of the communities, there was a surprise because one of the questions asks local government about disaster planning. And do you have a disaster plan for people with dementia? Because we know if people have to evacuate and go to a shelter, someone with dementia, it's an unfamiliar environment, they'll most likely exhibit some behavior, some agitation. And frankly, the communities were unsure if they had a disaster plan and included this component. So I think that was a surprise for all of us. So last, the, the final thing that you do in this process is get your community, your action team back together to discuss your priorities and then develop an action plan. So Janice, how are you going to do this last phase? Well, what we're gonna do is gonna get the groups together again in um, November 2nd and we're gonna have our survey team and our action team come together. Christine will come and present the findings. Then we'll meet with our action team and the action team will take a look at the findings and then decide what area they wanna focus on for the first year. So if it's training, it might be having the Alzheimer's Association come in to do some training or we could do training through the project, or there are other resources to do training. We can help you develop bilingual materials if you have a fact sheet on dementia. Maybe we can help you translate that into Portuguese. So the things that you develop are not necessarily high tech or expensive. They're meant to get the word out to be dementia friendly. Thank you, Janice. So I'm going to turn this over to Arthur Bergeron, and he is going to tell you give you some examples how a community can be dementia friendly. Oh, I don't need that one. Thank you. Um, so, just as a brief background, so I'm in, I live in Marlboro and I, I actually chaired the, the action team in, in Marlboro. So we're, we're doing exactly what Janice did and, and I just wanna start off by saying how much we really appreciate what Bay Path is doing. Bay Path Elder Services this, this is, they're being the leader really throughout the state in terms of trying to encourage the communities in their area. There are 14 communities in Bay Path, including Framingham and Ashland and Holliston and Hopkinton. So a lot of the folks that are, that are here today, as well as our communities, Marlboro, Northboro, Southboro, Westboro. And, and, and one of the things that, that she's really tried to encourage is to have a set of communities go through this process so that we can kind of figure out, based on that experience, how, we could, how it could happen in other communities. And I think it's just this great initiative. But whenever I'm talking, to, and, and, and 
So I get interested, I'm a local guy, I do, I'm a, I do elder law, it's my day job, but I grew up in Marlboro and I'm still there and I chaired this committee. And these, the folks that we're talking about are a lot like, I, I often use for my example in, in, my, uh, in my work, my, my friends Frank and Mary, um, who are older and they, they, they live in their old house and their goal is to live in their house until they die. And so my mother died in a nursing home, so I'm very aware of this. I'm the last of six kids. My oldest brother has an early stage diagnosis. He's 79. So I'm saying to myself, I want to have a dementia-friendly community in 13 years. <laughs> that's when I'm going to need it, because that's when I'm probably going to have it. So by that point, it's got to be dementia-friendly. Uh, and the question is kind of, what is that? So a dementia-friendly community, we often talk about um, a com trying to make a house safe for people who have dementia. Because of course everybody's goal, like my friends Frank and Mary, they want to live in their house until they die, they want to be buried in the backyard. Nobody wants to leave their house. And actually if you have dementia, that's the best place to be. Because a, your house is the place where you're always, no matter how bad things are, you're going to remember where the bathroom is in your house. And probably where the salt and pepper is. You know, and kind of, you're going to know, all, so it's the safest place to be as long as you can make your house safe. But then the question is, do you just stay in your house? Because we all know people that that's what happens. They just stay in their house because they or their spouse are, are embarrassed about this and because their, their neighbors, they kind of don't want to see their neighbors because their neighbors, they're like what Janice described. They're like kind of, oh, you know, they're not the same anymore and you kind of don't know what to say to, the, to these people. So a piece of this, is really about having the neighbors or helping the neighbors understand what the disease is about, but also ways to be treating folks, to be not going up to them, oh, you know, remember, right, you, you know what day, you know, you, you remember me, right, as opposed to, you know, you know, I'm Sarah or I'm Fred, I'm your neighbor, it's really nice to see you. Or to have a neighbor who's gonna be looking, if you're looking a little confused, and helping you get back home, right? So that you're still living in your home because the neighbors have awareness of this, and therefore, you don't have shame of it. Um, but that's gonna require some training. I know one of the things, that I, when I, the, the more that, I work, that I've worked with this, I realized, you know, people always talk about the various symptoms of dementia, and they are obviously a lot of, of there are a lot of cognitive things, you get confused, and you kind of don't remember where things are and stuff. But then there are these others, these really emotional things, like anger and, and aggressiveness and, or, or apathy. I really believe a lot of that we can get rid of if we do this, right? Because a lot of that is simply people reacting to the fact that they have the disease and that they can't remember and reacting to the way that people treat them. So for example, in a dementia-friendly community, the first responders coming from the fire station, right, if you've got a problem at home or from the ambulance service, are not going to be saying to you, you know, so what happened? No, that's the wrong question if you have dementia, you know. So you need, you need a set of players who are, you know are the people who are going to bump into these folks who really know how to deal with it, right? So they really need to be individually trained so that they're getting away from the kind of the joke that you often have at the fire station. Oh, those are just, that's, that lady, she's just one of the frequent flyers. We're there all the time, you know, as opposed to trying to figure out for those folks that you, you know where they are, how do you get them involved with the programs that you want to have available in the community? Or when you go to a restaurant. I think that's the classic example. I mean, right, I was at a restaurant yesterday. I'm having a lot of trouble now with 50, 50 choices. You know, that's just a lot of choices, right? So in a dementia-friendly community, maybe that's not what happens in the restaurant. Maybe it's really, oh, Mr. Bergeron, it's nice to see you. So would you like the chicken or the fish today? Or maybe, you know, the chicken's really good today, right? So it's, it's in a dementia-friendly community, the restaurants, like a lot of the local restaurants, people know you. One of the active people in our, in our um, group was a guy named Michael Kennedy. Kennedy's is the restaurant in Marlboro that you would have been going to, you know, kind of historically. It's kind of where people would go. And he says many of his clients, you know, he's been seeing them for years and years, but now, and now they're in their 70s or 80s, and maybe one of them has a problem, you know? And so adapting to that and training his staff for that is really important. I'll do one Kennedy's story. So one of the, another member that was on our, our team, who also is the head of the Council on Aging in Marlboro, uh, was at Kennedy's a couple months ago at the bar. Walked up to the bar um, and sees a, and sees a couple that come in to the, sit at the bar, an older couple, um, and obviously the wife has got some problems, right? And they're both sitting at the bar. 
uh, and the waitress comes over and so asks the couple, so can I get you your usuals? Oh yes, you know, and, and, and brings them out what looks like two highballs, right? Um, and Trisha's look, looking over to the, was like, wait a minute, doesn't she realize this woman has got dementia? Well, so then the couple is there and they're talking and 10 minutes later the waitress comes back, oh can I freshen up your drink? Right? And, and, and just, you know, pour, re, you know adding, adding to, the, to the drinks. And now Trish is really getting upset. You know, this is terrible. They're really, this, wom they're, this woman is being taken advantage of by this bartender, right? And so she kind of, you know, asked the waitress to go to the side and says, don't you realize that woman has got dementia? She said, oh yeah, she's been coming here for years. That's just, that's just, um, that's just ginger ale that's in the glass, you know? He said, that's the restaurant I want to go to when I have. <laughs> when I have dementia. So you need, to, you, need, you need staff training, you need menus, you need, you need you know, better signage, maybe a special menu, maybe even special hours. Maybe there's a time of day that is really the dementia friendly time. Uh, or maybe there are even, like, like what they've done actually at this place called Arthur's, it's the Memory Cafe. Um, this restaurant is actually part of the restaurant in Minnesota. One, one of the things that I think Christine mentioned is the key about, of this, this is not about trying to fund a gigantic research project to find the cure for Alzheimer's, right? That's certainly important, but not gonna happen by the time I get it. So we get, the things that need to be done are not these high-tech things that we have to figure out. It's just doing the things that are already being done in other places. So what about, actually that's one of the things that Kennedy's is considering. What about at an existing restaurant, so you have a couple hours during the, you know, Saturday from two to four, Right? Who goes Saturday from two to four? So during that time, you have a memory cafe. You encourage couples uh, or folks with their caregivers, with their kids to come, and you accept the fact that a lot of folks there are gonna have dementia, so that you, you know, the, the waitresses are prepared for it and you're keeping the, the menus down. And that may be one of the answers that comes out of these surveys in terms of what kinds of things can you do to make your community dementia friendly. Similarly at the grocery store. You know, as long as folks are living at home, they're gonna go, wanna go to Kennedy's, but they're also gonna wanna go shopping, right? And that's what they've always done. Um, so maybe that store, and, and there, how many stores are there in your community? Are there three, four, you know? How many places that you just need to make sure that there is staff there that are sensitive to seeing folks who have dementia, that you've got signage that's good, that you've probably got staff that when you ask, that they're gonna be aware to see people that look like they're having memory problems. So when they ask, so where's the tomato sauce? You're not just gonna say aisle seven and that's that. You know? You're gonna walk them over to the tomato sauce. And by the way, this has been done in a lot of places. There was this interesting initiative in, in, uh, in, at the Tesco, that's a supermarket chain in the, in the United Kingdom, uh, where they did that throughout their stores, as it happens, the manager of this store, his mother had had dementia, she's very sensitive to it, but he calls this basically building mental ramps into the store. You know, remember 30 years ago when there were no ramps and you went to these stores and if you, you know, if you, if you had a disability, you couldn't get in, right? Because of the ramps. So now everybody's got a ramp. So think about it in terms of, of, of mental ramps or in terms of our public places. Frank and Mary can always go to the park. They can always go to the local park, but you wanna make sure that the park is safe, right? That there are surfaces that are flat, that ideally it's designed so that you're not gonna get lost, or if you do get lost, there, you, people can have line of sight so the person that's with you can find you, where there are bathrooms, where, where, where folks can, where, and where there are programs. There's actually a, a whole set of these programs that have already been developed in Seattle. And what's, what's wonderful about the internet is that you can find these programs from all over to incorporate into your own town, where they're actu they actually have walking I want to say walking tours, but walking times specifically at the parks for folks who have dementia, right? So you've got you know, some, some action, and it's a coordinated program between their councils on aging and their parks department. So when you think about your community, what is a dementia-friendly community? It's a community that has, think about it place by place, where the, where the firemen kind of know what to do and where, the, where there is a disaster plan uh, and where there are restaurants that you can go to and still feel like, you're part of this town, you know, and supermarkets and, and your parks. So it's a place where you can, where, I always, it, where no matter how confused you get, you can still feel happy living in your own home. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Arthur. Does anybody have any questions? 
This has been a totally exciting initiative for us, starting out in the communities of Hudson, Marlboro, and Northboro. People often ask me, well, Bay Path, why did you choose these three communities? Well, our office is in Marlboro, and we chose Northboro, Marlboro, and Hudson because they're contiguous, so I figured, okay, we have a facilitator on the project, not a lot of traveling for her, Plus, I knew, I knew Janice for years. Janice and I have known each other a long time. I knew the other directors as well. And they were really on board with this project and doing it. So it's, it's been an exciting time for us. Some of the other questions that people have, well, what about the rest of the state? I mean, I have 14 communities in Metro West. What about the rest of the state? There is actually a dementia-friendly Massachusetts initiative out of the Executive Office of Elder Affairs and Jewish Family and Children's Services in Waltham, and we are working with them and supporting their efforts. So they are going to various communities, and folks are very, getting very engaged in this. For instance, Fall River just had their first community meeting. So we're trying to get this around the state in as many places as possible, and to be supported by the Executive Office of Elder Affairs and Secretary Alice Bonner is tremendous. This model that we're following, Act on Alzheimer's, is out of Minnesota. We chose it, A, for the data piece, and B, because everything was free. You can find it all on the internet. And we have a saying at the office, if it's free, it's for me. So they had a toolkit, which is essentially a roadmap. All the work was done. I didn't have to develop surveys. I didn't have to do anything. It was ready to go. We present to the selectmen or the city council first to let them know what they're doing. And their first question is, how much is it going to cost me? And the answer is nothing. It's a grant-funded project. We just need your support. We need your community to become involved. Because although I'm the funding source, this is not a Bay Path project. This is not a senior center project. This is a community project. That's how it works. It's a grassroots effort to get people together in the community to say, we want to be dementia friendly. And just like Arthur, I want to be you know, 75 or 80 and be able to still go out to dinner and the waitress says, do you want the uh, chicken parm or do you want the eggplant parm tonight? You know, easy choices for me. But I want to make sure that I remain safe in my community as well. So a totally, totally big effort. There's also another effort called Dementia Friendly America that is an offshoot of Act on Alzheimer's in Minnesota. So it is working to get all of America dementia friendly. So this is an issue on our horizon. And please don't think that dementia only affects people over the age of 65. That's a misnomer. There's early onset dementia that you can be in your 40s and diagnosed. I know a gentleman, he is in his mid-40s, diagnosed with early dementia, has a wife and two small children. He can no longer drive, he can no longer work. He's stuck at home because he can't go out. And he's very, inactive, he's very active in this initiative. So Janice said this affects families, and it does. So for this gentleman, he's the primary breadwinner. He's not paying into Social Security. His wife has to take time off to get him everywhere. So it's a really big impact. He should be out there. He, was, he worked in telecommunications and Verizon. He should be out there earning the money to put his kids through college, and he can't do that. So what, what does that do to his self-esteem? So he actually volunteers at the senior center because he's, he's, he knows IT so well, and he helps the individuals at the center with their their iPads and their iPhones and their laptops. So he's still engaged and he knows that's really, really important. So I'm glad he has that opportunity as well. But again, this is going to be a bigger problem. We haven't come to Framingham yet. We're working little by little. Phase one was those three communities. Phase two is Sudbury and Westboro. Westboro just had their community engagement meeting the other night and it went so, so well. We had people who were really excited about this initiative. I had a real estate agent come up to me afterwards and say, this is great. You have no, ma no idea how many older individuals I deal with who have dementia, who perhaps their children are trying to sell their home to get them into a more secure place. 
but she said it is so, so needed in the community. And everyone always says that. We need to recognize that our neighbors, our friends, our family members are going to be significantly impacted by this disease. So again, any questions? So if you want it in your community, go talk to your senior center director, have them talk to Bay Path. Right. Because they, the, the Bay Path goal is really to get it to every, community, every one of their 14 communities. Mm -hmm. And really, and if it's successful here, then that's going to end up being the model for the rest of the state. And it, so that, so, but among other things, so that if you end up with those memory cafes, you end up with people being able to go to a variety of places. Maybe you're going to the one in Marlboro one day and the one in Westboro one day. So folks can get out of the house. Right. Folks can get out of the house and feel like they're in a secure environment with no shame, right. with no shame. So our contact information is here. You can all, always call Arthur at Myrick. You can call Janice and Hudson, or you can call me at Bay Path Elder Services. So thank you very much for attending today. It was great to see all of you, and I hope to see you again in a dementia-friendly community. Thank you very much.